Take it away, Sonia. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to integrating software as a service into your IT strategy. So when the business wants to use something that you don't control, we talk about how you can protect themselves from themselves and maintain your sanity at the same time. A little bit about me. I'm actually a born and bred Cantabrian, um, but 12 years ago I made the move over to Australia and here. Yeah, this is my neighbourhood in winter in Brisbane. So it's a tough gig, but somebody's got to do it. Um, but the All Blacks are still the best rugby team in the world, okay? So definitely still a Kiwi at heart. So I grew up in IT after leaving high school, doing tech support, systems administration, and then systems architecture for banking, government departments, so some really large uh, New Zealand enterprises. But for the past 12 years, I've played in the SMB space, um, which is also presents itself with a unique set of challenges. But it's put me in a really unique position because I've seen the rise of cloud, I've been able to get my head around the new technologies as they come on board, but I also understand what constrains businesses and what constrains large IT departments. So, um, my name's Regan, I work for, for Microsoft. Um, I had my head in the clouds for a couple of years anyway, uh, but before that I was working on CRM systems, uh, which people were using out of the cloud, so you know, I've been around SaaS as well. Um, this is not my backyard, this is Sonia's backyard. Uh, I still live in New Zealand, uh, and um, while the weather's lovely up there and it's beautiful, there's, there's a couple of things, you know, redbacks. Sonia told me she found some of these in her house the other week. Yeah, I did. Yeah, snakes. <laughs> not the and snakes. Then, uh, Ah, this one here is a bit scary. Ah, drop bears. I'm staying in New Zealand. I'll just visit Australia. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm staying here. Yeah, um, look, yeah, together we'll cover APAC. It's all right, mate. Very good. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about why software as a service is a thing and why it's a thing that we uh, need to be aware of. Uh, Simon Sinek always says start with why, so I think that's a great place to start. This is a quote that I heard on a webinar last month. We are a business of millennials. When looking at technology solutions, we immediately cross off anything that has to be installed. Okay, these are your competitors. This is the new workforce. Can anybody take a guess at what industry this business was from? Sounds like one of these Silicon Valley startups, right? Millennials, gotta love them. Actually, this was an accounting firm. Accountants and bookkeepers, one of the more traditional industries that you can get, and this is their new approach to software and the cloud. They don't want to be installing things. Gartner reported that by 2017, chief marketing officers would be spending more money on IT than CIOs. So we really are in a position where it's business driven, okay? And this kind of adds to some of the weight of that argument. So what they're seeing is that as a percentage of profit, the money spent on marketing-based IT initiatives is a lot greater than the money spent on pure IT initiatives. And that's also growing. So marketing budgets are increasing even more to take on board new digital initiatives more than IT budgets are themselves. There are a lot of business drivers pushing this, a lot of reasons why the business might want to look at applications outside your infrastructure. Ease of use. If you can use a browser, you can use a SaaS app, goes the saying. They want to enable their flexibility of their workforce to work from wherever they want to work. It might give them access to external data, so they might be looking at things like Twitter for sentiments from their customers. They may also have budget issues, Apex, Copy, uh, yeah, um, CapEx versus OpEx, and where they're spending their money. They like the cost transparency of cloud, so they like to see a price that provides them with a big level of service, as opposed to some of our IT initiatives, where things like the budgets for the salary of the IT people kind of fall into another bucket. And they also like the speed of cloud. When they can provision something just by putting in their corporate credit card, they don't have to jump through all the hoops of going through IT approval. And thanks to vendors, not to mention anybody, we're also seeing vendors push quite heavily their cloud solutions by throwing licenses at us willy-nilly for their cloud services. So yeah, there's a little bit of um, encouragement there from our IT vendors to go cloud. Cool, so there are a bunch of IT drivers as well which are making people have a look at SaaS applications, uh, and we'll have a look at some of those. 
So um, the first one we've got there is bursting. There's a lot of companies out there that um, you know, they've got a market, they've been running for a while, that's cool. But what happens if they want to grow their audience? Uh, you know, if they want to reach larger audiences? If you're running that stuff on a bit of tin in your, in your own uh, offices and you want to grow it bigger, um, it costs quite a lot to you know, scale out to burst to larger numbers. With um, SaaS apps, you can do that nice and easily. The, the, the vendor takes care of that for you. Um, failure protection, you know, a lot of time and effort goes into backing up your workloads, the DR um, strategies, the rest of it. Uh, SaaS, that's pretty much taken care of for you as well. Uh, we've got security as well. So, you know, security, if you're a small business, somebody walking in the front door, you know, saying, hi, I'm the, the fire alarm checking guy, can I check out the back? Uh, I, I suppose so, sure. They could walk out there, they could take your server, they could walk out the front door and you, you know, that, that's the thing that can happen. In the cloud, you know, security is somebody else's problem and you know, they're going to do probably a better job of it than you can. Uh, less on-call action. You know, if your system goes down, you're not scrambling around trying to do it. You know, sit down in the chair, put your feet up, wait for the vendor to fix it for you. Um, chances are you know, a, few a few people might be affected, but uh, the vendor will probably fix it faster than you with uh, a lot less stress. Maintenance as well, you know, if you want a new version, you're running CRM for example, I had a lot of customers running CRM, they um, you know, deployed it, they never patched it, they're always worried about it. In the cloud, you know, this maintenance, these upgrades, they're all taken care of for you. Um, you know, they do all the testing, occasionally something might break, but generally they'll have you know, wider testing, you'll be up to the same version, you'll keep going, you don't have to worry about that either. And the last thing is that it leaves you as a business, as an IT team, um, time to focus on you know, the core competencies that you can do as an IT team. Um, instead of trying to figure out how to make something work or how, some, how to make something start working again, um, you, know, you can concentrate on providing better value and, and helping your business adopt new technologies without having you know, to get your fingers stuck in all of the cogs. Oops, Sounds pretty good so far. So why do we see software as a service as a threat? This is why. This is one of my favorite, favorite slides. Um, and you can actually find it on TechNet. It just speaks to the level of control. And as an IT system administrator, control is one of the things that we really, really like. So to give up that control as we go up the cloud stack from infrastructure as a service right through to software as a service where we really don't control much at all, that's a bit of a cultural change to wrap your head around. I'll let you take some photos of that one. I know it's a pretty popular. We will put the slides up uh, on the yeah, channel yeah, 9 as well, so you so will you be able to grab, download the deck if you, you like. You can grab a section of, section of those. The reality is that in 2016, if IT doesn't provide a business capability and provide it fast, the business will go out and get it. And I know that that is a scary concept. And I'm not sure if you believe me, but we've got a great survey here where 81% of the line of business workers and 83% of the IT staff admitted to using non-approved SaaS apps. The thing that concerns me is whether or not the other 17% of the IT staff just didn't admit it. <laughs> okay, so you know, th these are some pretty scary statistics. At the recent AWS summit in Sydney, there was a gentleman on stage by the name of James Moore. James Moore is the head of market risk for Origin Energy, one of Australia's large electricity companies. He is not an IT guy. James wanted to run some data through some test analytics, and the systems that he wanted to use in the cloud weren't approved by the company. So he went out and put them on a credit card and started using them. But wait, it gets better. The cloud application that he wanted to use was actually blocked on the corporate network by the IT administrators. So we went across the road and used the free Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, we're not really excited about that, are we? <laughs> okay. Now, Origin Energy are very quick to point out that it was a dummy sample of test data. So none of my electricity account information made it past all of these security channels. But at AWS Summit, this was the hero thing to do. This was a great example of the business enabling themselves with a new capability. No, <laughs> no, just no. So <laughs> the reason that they do that is because they see IT as the bad cop. They see us as putting roadblocks in place 
for things that they want to try and do. They forget that the reason we have these roadblocks in place is because of things like compliance and things like disaster recovery and all the hoops we have to jump through to protect the internal IT infrastructure because that's what we need to do to protect the business. That kind of goes out the window. So our job is to really work with the business to see how we can relax some of those roadblocks, educate the business users, educate the IT management, and see how we can start playing together. We look at things like data security life cycles. Where is your data? Is it encrypted? Is it encrypted at risk? Is it encrypted when it's stored? What's your end of life process for your media? All of those kind of things we look at when we're putting data in our infrastructure. You need to ask the hard questions if the business wants to use SaaS solutions. Now, I don't think for a minute that a lot of the SaaS providers are going to give you a high level of detail and give you all their state secrets about how they do that kind of stuff. But go out there and ask. Your business, your data, your risk. They might give you a sanitized high level version, but you need to go back to the business and get the business to sign off that they are happy with that. Okay, if that's the answer you're going to get. But it's far easier to ask the questions first. Microsoft has a little software as a service product that you might have heard of called Office 365. And Office 365, as a SaaS product, knows the concerns of IT administrators. So Office 365 has built in things like non-owner mailbox request reports. So you can actually run reports on Exchange Online mailboxes to find out who is accessing what in terms of data in that mailbox that wasn't the mailbox owner. So it's a really nice compliance and auditing feature. In the E5 plan, we've also got things like customer lockbox. So customer lockbox means that Microsoft engineers can go through an approval process to ask you for access to your data. By default, they can't see it. Sometimes when you're troubleshooting an IT problem, it's really nice to be able to see what the end user is seeing and how the data is behaving. So the Microsoft engineers can go through a process using customer lockbox to request access to that data, which will then get released and then roll back when the problem ticket's closed. If you want to learn more about those kind of features and how Office 365 protects your data, trust.office365.com is the place to be for all that kind of information. Cool. So uh, SaaS infrastructure um, is, is one of those other things that people are uh, asking about. Um, you know, where is that data going? Where is it stored? Is it secure? Can you know, the fire warden walk through the front door, say he's a fire warden, grab a USB and stick it in the server and walk off with the data? Um, well, not really, no. Uh, what we've got up here is uh, two, uh, two forms or two methods uh, of access that you might need to use to get into a data center. The one on the left, a passport, pretty obvious, right? It's your identity. So you, you need to provide your identity before you go to a data center. Um, if you're just on a visit, you don't get any closer than a, than a glass screen that you can look through. Um, but you still have to go through this identity, this background check, the rest of it. Um, if you're actually getting access to computers on the floor, then it's a lot longer process. You've got to go through a lot more checks. Does anybody know what the one on, the, on, on your right is for? <laughs> yep, left anything behind. So this is uh, scales. When you go and visit some data centers, you actually have to step on some scales. They will, you know, the, first they'll ask you to leave all your phones and everything behind, put it in a tray. They'll ask you to step on the scales. You'll go into the data center, you'll do your stuff and then you'll step on the scales on the way back out, and they'll make sure that you still weigh you know, more or less the same, that you haven't left anything behind or brought anything out with you. So um, yeah, compared to the open door in a small business, somebody walking in, um, data centers have got some pretty complex security procedures and, and protocols in there. Um, and of course, uh, you know, if you've watched the movies, you've seen the eye scans and the, and the palm readers and all the rest of that sort of stuff as well. Um, for the data centers themselves, or at least the Microsoft data centers, you know, there's a whole bunch of certifications that we, um, that we have to pass and comply with uh, in order to be you know, compliant for our customers. Um, things like the ISO 27001, which you know, controls things around how we build data centers and access and storage, um, right through to things like uh, HIPAA, which is required in the states for holding health data. Um, you know, we also see the, the New Zealand uh, GCIO logos up here. Um, so we have worked uh, in, in New Zealand with the government on um, you know, what, what levels of um, 
security are required on the, uh, on the Azure and the Office 365 data centers for New Zealand businesses to use it. And just recently, in fact, we've, uh, we've actually ratified with the ministries here that um, people that are storing health and patient record data are now actually allowed to use the Microsoft Office Cloud services to do that for Office 365, for CRM, and several of the uh, Azure services. So, you know, if you're, if you're concerned about security, um, we do have a lot of boxes ticked. If your business needs to, you know, tick those boxes and measure them off against a report, um, then you can ask our people to provide you with the appropriate security report so that you can have those ticked off with your security people. Cool. So, terms and conditions. T's, T's and C's. Look, the devil is in the detail and the terms and conditions of the software as a service app that you are signing up for, the business is signing up for, is going to spell out in pretty clear legal terms what you're actually giving access to and what the data can be used for. So, this is a slightly popular consumer based service. Um, and when you start to have a look at sort of the, all of the information that they can use and take, um, it's a little bit scary for those of us that use said service. So please, read the fine print. I know T's and C's are annoying. I know when we go and do an update on our devices, we just hit agree um, and accept because we know if we say no, we're not getting the upgrade. But SaaS applications in a business, it's really, really important for someone, especially somebody in the legal team, to read the fine print and sign off that that's okay. Office 365 is very, very strong on privacy. Um, I love the line at the bottom where they spell it out very clearly that they do not use what you say in email, chat, video calls, or voicemail, or your documents, photos, or other personal files to target ads to you. Okay? Nice and simple. Gonna drop the mic on that one. Look, an identity and access management, I think, is one of the main things that we can do as IT administrators to watch out for with SaaS apps. What we're trying to avoid is isolated pockets of identities in different places in the cloud because they all want to do sign-ons differently. So just quickly, who's using SaaS apps in the cloud already? Um, and that includes Office 365. Cool. So many of you have got Office 365. What about other applications? So still quite a few, excellent. Yeah. Um, and how many of you are um, you know, synchronizing your active directories from on-prem to the cloud? Awesome, we've got quite, a, yeah, quite an advanced room here, great. excellent. Um, so uh, for, for the rest of you, <laughs> there's still a few that haven't, um, one of the things that you can do is, uh, 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 when you are accessing SaaS applications, um, one of the things you don't want to do is have to make your users remember another login, another password. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you can actually take your on-premises Active Directory, you can sync it to the cloud, and then you can use that identity to access many other services in the cloud. Uh, Office 365 is an obvious one. Um, you know, Dynamic CRM as well, being a Microsoft app, is another obvious one as well. So the people you know, log on their PC, the username and password they use to sign on their PC is the same that they can bang into the browser and access their Outlook or bang into their phone when they sync, it, sync their mail to their phone, et cetera. Um, we can set that up to synchronize from on-prem to the cloud. Uh, some, some companies are quite happy to synchronize password hashes into the cloud and let our authentication servers you know, do all of the hard work of, of um, you know, resolving passwords. Some uh, organizations don't want that at all. So there is the option to configure your identity sync so that none of the password data goes to the cloud um, and that when a user authenticates, it always redirects back to your on-premises servers. So you know, the, the, the account ID is in the cloud, but the password is never in the cloud. If you do go down that path, though, then you need to make sure you have a highly, highly available environment, because if your premises goes down, then nobody can authenticate to, to anything in the cloud. There is a massive marketplace on our Azure Active Directory with lots of third-party products that you can actually integrate as well. Um, you're seeing a few up here, um, but there are apps like um, Google Apps, for example, Facebook at Work, um, Salesforce here. Uh, and if you are using, let's say you're using Salesforce, uh, with, off, uh, with um, Azure Active Directory, there is the ability to plug into Salesforce and have the same username and password be used to provision a Salesforce account for you, and then somebody can go straight to salesforce.com, start typing in that password, you'll be passed back to our authentication server or your authentication server for the password, and then pass back to salesforce.com. Um, and that's really quite nice for IT because it means that you don't have to go and create users and, and register them in, in yet another service. 
Um, if you're interested in this kind of identity stuff and you haven't looked at federation, you haven't gone to the expense of federated servers because your organisation might be a little bit smaller, I can highly recommend tracking down session BRK3107. Now, that was a Microsoft Ignite in the US just recently session, and there's a little glimpse of what is coming with the new Azure AD Connect that will let you do some more authentication and password pass through without the need for federated servers. Um, and, uh, whoops, I've gone backwards, sorry. Let's go the other way. How did I do that? Went about six slides backwards. <laughs> I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, if you do have your Azure AD um, hooked up to the cloud um, and you do want to start integrating some of these applications to it, uh, there is a control panel that you can do that. And this is a screenshot that I've taken from one that I've had set up. And um, you know, one of the things that you can see here, Office 365 is listed there. I have an integration with Dropbox for business. Um, if I want a user to have a Dropbox, I just click on the user, I tick Dropbox. The, the service will go to Dropbox, provision a Dropbox, create the account, send an email to the user, tell them it's ready to go. Um, but it's all done from a single checkbox in here. Uh, and the other one that I quite like um, is this Twitter uh, option here. So one of the things you can do is you can go and configure Twitter. You can configure it up with a single sign-on. Um, and then you can assign us accounts to use Twitter. And in this case here, we're looking at, you know, we've got a company marketing account that's using Twitter. Um, normally what happens is, you know, there's a marketing team, 12 or 13 people. You know, everybody knows their Twitter account handle. Everybody knows the password. Um, that's great. They'll log on. They do their tweeting and stuff and, and all's hunky-dory uh, until somebody leaves the company. And then, um, oh, sorry, and, and when they access it, so when they leave the company, you get something like this that could happen. So somebody left the company, Nokia here, jumped on the Twitter account after they left, pushed out a you know, pretty nasty message on, online. Um, and uh, it was after they'd left that um, you know, people realized that they hadn't reset the password. They hadn't told the 12 other people to, to change the password on the Twitter. So um, what we can do in the Azure AD is we can actually configure this. We can key in the password. Um, and then we can make Twitter available to people as a button on their dashboard. They can click on the Twitter button, it will take them to Twitter, it will log them in, it will put in the password, it will do all that. The user need never know the password. So when that person leaves the company, you go into your AD on premises, you tick the disable user button. No more access to Twitter, no more access to Office 365, no more access to Salesforce, mm -hmm. Dropbox, all of the rest of that sort of stuff. So having that sort of single sign-on and these mapped user accounts linked back to your directory you know, it gives you a lot more control over all these other SaaS applications you integrate without having to you know, go and manage it in 10 different places. So let's just jump back forwards. Um, we've also got this, uh, this uh, tool called, or this service called Azure Information Protection. Um, some of you might have seen the predecessor. It used to be called Azure Rights Management Service. It's had some other stuff added to it and it's been uh, enhanced. Um, but this is a service that you can use with Office 365 and other data across your, um, your SaaS applications. What it will do is it'll actually understand the sort of data that you're working with, you're sharing. So if somebody says, uh, you know, types up an email, you know, pastes their driver's license number in it and hits the send button, for example, um, what the service can do is it can look at that data, it can classify it, it sees this thing that looks like a driver's license or maybe a credit card number. It'll tag that and say, this is content that has you know, a driver's license number or a, a credit card number in it. It'll look at a policy. Um, the policy will say, you know, driver's license numbers are allowed to be uh, shared externally. Um, no, they're not. And it'll actually stop the person from sending that email. Or if it's a document that's stored in SharePoint, for example, or um, somewhere else in some file storage, it'll classify it or know it, and it won't let you actually attach that to an email and send it outside of your organization. Um, for some applications that you're running on your phone or your laptop, it can even extend out and stop that data from leaving those applications. So you can start to use some of these external SaaS applications, combine it with the information protection, and protect some of that data that you're trying to keep within your firewall, um, but not necessarily have it within your firewall. You can still protect it when it goes outside of that. Yep. Um, and that one's quite important too, because when you think about people that are using other tools, they might be using Slack, they might be sharing files with other people in different applications outside what you control. If we can control the, app, the data at the source, um, then we're kind of one step ahead of the game. Change management, that's a biggie for SaaS, because we've all got really tight controls and very locked in change management processes for managing changes to our own applications, managing changes to our infrastructure. And then this lovely world of SaaS comes along 
And change is what happens when we find out there's a new feature and all of our users have got it already. The best place to be on top of changes in the Microsoft Cloud is the Microsoft Roadmaps. So keep an eye on fasttrack.microsoft.com forward slash roadmap. That is the best place to get the information on what's happening with Office 365, what changes are planned and up and coming, what's just been released and when it's been released. Now, I encourage you to plug into whatever technical support desks you can for your other SaaS applications to find out from them how do I stay in the loop with what you're planning to roll out and when, you're planning to, when you are planning to roll it out. The other thing that you need to understand is have visibility of what SaaS applications are being used in your business and where you need to fit them into your own change management processes. So if you are going through and putting in some infrastructure changes, some networking changes, firewalls, access rules, whatever, what on the periphery in terms of SaaS applications are actually being used by the business and might need to be included in your testing process. Chances are they might not break, but especially if you're doing stuff with your DMZ or your external networking, just have it as a tick box and know that you've signed it off. So on Monday morning, the business isn't going to come crying that you've now blocked access to their favorite SaaS app. SLAs are the very best reason why you need to make sure that your SaaS applications are business grade and not consumer grade. There is a reason that consumer SaaS applications are generally free or low cost. That's because they don't come with great availability and SLAs like business SaaS applications do. So, you also need to make sure that you're talking to both IT management and the business management about the realities of SLA with cloud applications. They need to understand that you are not in control when something goes wrong. You can't ask Facebook to fix it faster. Okay, so they need to be aware of what kind of service you're going to get and what the responses are and the fact that it's going to be outside of your control. And just, um, just another thing on the SLAs. So Microsoft offers SLAs with its services, Office 365, uh, Azure, and Dynamics CRM. Um, they are financially backed SLAs, so if the service is down and it's down for a certain length of time, um, you know, we are obliged to uh, you know, credit back um, usage uh, and things to you. Now, as a business, you might think that um, you know, getting some credit for this thing being down for a couple of hours, it, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really help, um, you know, compensate you much. Um, but the, the, the main thing with these SLAs is that uh, you know, if, you're, if the service goes down, it's a small amount that they have to pay back to you, or we have to pay back to you. But if you think of 100,000 customers' services going down, and we're having to pay this back to 100,000 customers, um, the, the, the financial thing on these SLAs really puts a uh, uh, you know, push into us to get it fixed because uh, you know, you know, while, it's not, you know, while we're not handing heaps of money back to you, it's, uh, it's, it's hurting us and it's bleeding us, so it's really motivating us to get it back online as fast as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Business continuity planning and disaster recovery. How are you protecting the data inside the SaaS application? Do you need an additional level of protection over and above what the SaaS vendor is telling you that they do in terms of backups? Do you have visibility of the SaaS applications within your own disaster recovery process and your BCP? Best thing you can do is work with the business to understand how they're using a SaaS app and how the business is going to be impacted if that SaaS application is not available, even if you don't control it and you can't fix it because they're going to get used to it. And I was on a project where half of our branch network at the bank had email and the other half didn't. And when email went down, the half of the branch network that had email were lost. They didn't know what to do. And I'm looking at it going, guys, the rest of the branch network are still operating because they don't have that technology. They haven't adopted it. It's not part of their business processes and they're still managing to serve customers really, really well. So just watch, because the adoption of SaaS technology in your business is going to be quite fast and they're going to rely upon it. So you need to make sure that they have the processes in place and they understand how to run their business without it if they need to. My mother was in the banking industry. She worked in the bank before I was born. And by the time I grew up and I was old enough to go out into the workforce, my mum was one of the only tellers left in the bank that knew how to operate paper-based if the computer systems went down. And back in those days, they went down a heck of a lot more than they do these days. But it's, it's very, very important to show the business that you've got their back and you are there to keep them running, even when an IT system's down that's now out of your control. 
And last, but definitely not least, your people, the most important part of your organisation. If your IT professionals have been looking after the same systems for a few years now and haven't upgraded their skills, they're going to be a little bit concerned about the SaaS thing, whether or not it's another vendor's SaaS application or it's a move to Microsoft's cloud. They're going to want to know if they still have a job. They are going to want to know what their role is in IT if the business is using apps that they don't have any involvement in. They're going to need test licenses to play with, time to get up to speed. I want you to realise that, shock horror, not all IT people are comfortable with change. I know, surprises me too. Okay, but you need to take your technical people on the journey with you and don't just force change on them. Bring them along on the journey too and make sure they know that you've got their back to upskill them as well. The users. Now, there was a fantastic session that I urge you to look up on the recordings on Office 365 adoption. Okay, this is not an adoption plan. Adoption plans are not a series of emails before an on go live day. Okay, we already have some cultural issues with how the business perceives the IT department. And what they think of a successful IT rollout is completely different to what we think of it. We think a successful rollout happens when we implement something and it goes to plan and it's delivered on schedule and on budget and people can log in and use it. And that's kind of where we stop, right? Businesses take IT adoption success as we can use it and it's making a difference. Now you might not have a lot of influence in that depending on what your IT role is, but you need to have the focus that the adoption part of the technology is actually probably even more important, to be honest, than giving them access to the tech itself. Technology doesn't make a difference in a business. People using technology makes a difference in your business, okay? So I can't stress any more how important and passionate I feel about leading your users through adoption. I also want to make sure that we're not pigeonholing people or different user groups into what we think they do with tech or how we think they're going to use it. Let the learners guide that journey. They know their job and their business process better than you, and they might actually see uses for this technology that you didn't even think of because they know how, how their job works. The reality is that we really need to start doing IT at the speed of business. And I know that we have all these new terminologies coming up and DevOps is the thing and cloud is the thing. Um, but the more we can work with the business um, and the more that we can show them that we are there to enable them, we do want to exist to help them do great things, but we also are there to pull back the reins a little bit because we know the compliance issues and we know what happens when things fall over and we're there to protect them as well. Okay, so maybe a meeting of the two minds and coming together, we can start doing a wee bit more of this and really see some innovation and some cultural change in our organisations. It's a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. I expect that you have gone away with more questions than answers from the session because you know your business, you know where you are at with SAS, you know what's on the horizon. Um, but I hope that I've given you sort of a broad overview of things to look out for. Maybe uh, you've taken a few notes about things you need to check for your plans when you get back into the office. There are a lot of Microsoft Ignite New Zealand sessions on these particular topics. And what I've done is I've added in some particular sessions into this slide deck. These sessions have already happened, so when you go back to the office, you can come back to this recording and have a look at a few of the other sessions that have been recorded that I've recommended. And you can go and track those down if you're interested in sort of taking the conversation further. In addition to that, uh, there's also some coming up on uh, security, identity, and mobile device management. So they're Thursday, Friday. If you're interested in any of those sort of components, I suggest that you go along to those sessions as well. So Is there anything else you wanted to say, yeah, Regan? Before we move on, has mm. anybody got any particular questions around um, implementing SaaS applications, any concerns? Um, you know, that, that you want to ask or, or, or ask of us at, at, at this time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yep. Okay. So the question that was asked there is, is what is the exit strategy 
Um, and this is one of the biggest uh, things that people worry about when they move to a SaaS application. You know, what if you set everything up in that SaaS application? What if it's not working out? What if you want to pull back and then go to somewhere else? Um, well, I think that the exit strategy, it's going to depend on which SaaS application you're, you're um, moving to. Um, you know, if you're moving to Office 365, for example, you're moving mail there, um, there are plenty of tools that you can use to pull mail back out, plenty of tools that you can use to move documents out of, out of SharePoint. Um, if you're using dynamic CRM, for example, um, there are APIs that are open, there are tools that you can use to suck data back out, um, or even build an integration to migrate to you know, another product. Um, so some of those, uh, some of those products, you can, you can go into it knowing that there are ways to get it out. Um, I think in dynamic CRM, for example, um, you can still actually call the support desk and say, um, I don't want to be in CRM online anymore. Can you pull a copy of my database out, send it to me? Um, and then you can connect that database to a CRM server on premises. So you can basically take your installation and run it on premises. Um, but there, you know, there are a lot of SaaS applications out there that may not have those sort of APIs. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah. do you have anything it's, there? It's a really good question to ask, and it's a great question to ask at the start of the project. From a non-Microsoft perspective, I couldn't tell you how to get data out of Slack if I wanted to re retain historical information about conversations or files that went in on there. So that's a really good question. Uh, Zero, for example, so I do a lot of work with Zero with small business partners. They actually have a really nice exit strategy where you can export a significant amount of information out of your database in a standard format that you can import into a different accounting product. They also retain your financial information in their systems for, I think it's seven years for legal requirements for financial data. They'll turn your access off and you won't be allowed to access it while you're not paying for the service. But if anything comes up in that time period, say you do get slapped on the wrist with an audit, and you know, the tax office wants to see the, the raw data or the files, you can actually call up Zero, and they will negotiate a fee to give you one-time access to your data set for that kind of purpose. So it is a really great question. Yeah, I guess the main thing is you know, you, you're going to have to evaluate the risks, um, understand the system you're moving to. You know, if, if, if there's a large risk that you're not going to stay there and you're going to move on, um, then perhaps you should have a think more about you know, heading there in the first place, I guess. Um, yeah. There's another Excellent. question over here somewhere. No? No more questions. Yeah? With the automated um, tax system that you might get from the data, mm -hmm. how do you really make that part of uh, those issues that people get that from the impact or from the person coming in? So, so yeah. the, the question was um, with the automatic patching or automatic updating of versions from the vendor, how do you mitigate that? How do you, you know, work around? Um, you know, suddenly having your business not working because an upgrade has broken everything? Um, it, comes down to, it comes down to the vendor and it also comes down to the integrations that you have between that system and other systems. Microsoft has done it really well with things like um, the branches, uh, the channels that are available in, say, Office 365 Pro Plus, where you can actually divide up your user base into different segments in terms of who gets which of the new features first and who's on a delay and who's on, who's on an even further delay. So there are some SaaS vendors that realise that they do have to enable IT administrators to have a staged process of, of how those come out. There are other SaaS vendors who just release it and to some extent, you have to put a bit of trust into them on what they're doing because they control the environment, they have their platform on a certain level and they are responsible for sort of integration testing of bugs and, and features and things in their own platform and that's why they can fast release so well is because they know that everybody using their product is on the same version. They don't have to retrofit and take into account old versions and, and compatibility and those kind of things but it really does just come down to the SaaS vendor in terms of getting that relationship with them and saying how do we keep one step ahead of what your releases are? How do we know what's coming up so that we know what to test or what potentially might break with the integrations we've got with our systems if, if you do something? So, so how many people in here are Windows Insiders running you know, the Windows Insider release? Okay. And how many people are Office Insiders? A smaller handful, cool. <laughs> um, so we do have this program. It's much like the Windows Insider program. It's called the Office Insider program. Um, where you can actually sign up for preview releases of Office and Office 365 services. 
Um, so much like Windows and Windows Insiders, you could run a small group of people or a test group on some of these Insider releases and, and you'll be able to test some of these features that are being rolled out before they get rolled out to the rest of your organization. Um, Dynamic CRM, for example, um, if you're using that product, um, typically when they have a, a big release, they've had a period of time um, in which you could elect when to go and, and they'll give you some um, access to be able to go and fire up a, a CRM system using the new stuff to test some things before you're forcibly pushed up to the new version. Uh, and um, yeah, some, some of the other applications out there, they do have you know, beta servers, beta sites where you can go and test these things. Um, with a you know, three-month window or sometimes a six-month window before you're forced into those upgrades. Um, so in some cases, it is well thought about. In other cases, you just get what you get and don't get upset <laughs> or do. Awesome. Questions? As I said, um, do a Google search, sorry, a Bing search. <laughs> BRK3107 is the session ID from the Microsoft Ignite session. They haven't released too much information yet because it's not actually available until sometime next year, but there was a slight hint about what's to come from the team over there. BRK3107 was the session ID from Microsoft Ignite, and there is a slide in particular in there that talks about an announcement that is coming. Um, I haven't got any information from them other than that session yet as much as I've pushed, but yeah, just keep but, your eye out for that. But that said, the, um, the single sign-on um, has been, uh, you know, there, there is, a, it is a feature within uh, Azure Active Directory. Um, you can configure single sign-on and provisioning for a handful of applications right now, um, of which you know, Google for, for work, um, Dropbox for business, Salesforce, um, all, all the Office 365 and Dynamics, obviously, um, and a few other apps will actually have that provisioning chain and that configuration chain already built into the service. Um, then there's a bunch of other, another 8,000 apps that you can do a mapped password version instead, um, which doesn't have a fully, you know, interlinked integration between the two systems, but you can effectively get a single sign-on um, by providing the user with a control panel. They click a button, it will take them and sign them in on their behalf. Um, and you can do that with a, you know, a password that the user saves and, and it just remembers it, or you can do that where the administrator creates and assigns the password and the user never knows it. Um, there's also, uh, in some of those services, the ability to, to, to randomize the password and randomly update it. Um, so the service will change, you know, the Twitter password, if you tick on a button that says, you know, randomly update the password every month, the service will go and create a new password, assign it to that Twitter service, um, and, and, you know, keep those passwords rotating as well. That's right. Sure. Yeah, so, so you've got bespoke applications that you're running on premises that... Okay. Yep. Okay, so, so there are also ways to get, um, you know, if you're running applications on premises, um, to get that single sign-on using Azure AD as well. Um, Windows Server and the, um, uh, and the uh, ADFS proxy um, and web application proxy, I think, as well, um, gives a way to have the Azure AD hook back in and, and do a single sign-on and actually present on-premises applications out through the web as well. Um, and then one of the things that we've also done recently, there's some companies might be using Ping Federate as an um, identity um, tool. Uh, we've also announced a partnership with Ping to merge that with AD. So applications that are made available to, you know, outside of the, the firewall um, to users, uh, to phones and things with Ping will actually work in with the Azure AD integration and um, you know, we'll be able to do that single sign-on uh, with those uh, kind of identity integrations as well. Um, but there is a lot more, as Sonia said, coming in that space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one to, to look into. Awesome. Any other questions? No, we've questioned you out. Thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming to my session. Please remember to go and fill in your evaluations and win some great prizes. I actually am an example of someone who won an Xbox One back in the day from doing a TechEd evaluation, so the system works. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good.